Turkish fighter jets struck an Islamic target in Syria just today. It says the Turkish F-16 struck three Islamic state targets in Syria on July 24th, according to a statement from the Turkish Prime uh, Minister's office. So I guess that uh, eliminates uh, Turkey from being ISIS's uh, uh, ally. Early on in this fight, many were saying that Turkey was funding uh, the Islamic State. With this report, that seems to be untrue now. But here's another article coming out of the national interest that I want you to pay attention to. It's called Creepin'. Here's how Iran will really build the bomb. And this really caught my mind. Uh, I really thought that it would be a little bit different, but uh, this is something that uh, the analysts believe this is the route that Iran will take in order to ultimately create their nuclear bomb. And the subheading of this article states, The real danger is that the mullahs, we're talking about Iran, will put off a breakout attempt or, uh, in the next decade or so while creeping out of their obligations. Let me explain that. The Obama administration and the P5, I should say, I should include them as well, uh, have this plan going that will try to attempt to keep Iran from breaking out at any given point, and the, the breakout time would be somewhere around a year, meaning it would take a year for them to finally gear up and create a nuclear bomb. And the article says, in an overt breakout, Iran brushes aside nuclear inspectors and begins openly racing to enrich weapons-grade uranium using its two declared uh, enrichment plants at Natanz and Fordo. The JCPOA ostensibly blocks this uh, path by limiting the number of centrifuges Iran can operate to 5,000 and change. And uh, capping the amount of low enriched uranium uh, it can uh, keep on hand to use as feedstock at 300 kilograms. This supposedly lengthens its breakout time, how quickly it can produce sufficient uh, fusel material for one atomic bomb should it make a rush to use one from two or three months at present to at least a year giving the international community more time to mobilize a response to the breakout. Now, in a covert breakout or sneak out, Iran builds parallel infrastructure in secret to produce the fusel material for a bomb. The JCPOA ostensibly uh, blocks this path with an inspections regime, regime designed to detect the diversion of fusel material, the construction of illicit centrifuges, off the books uranium mining and so forth. So what they're saying is that whether they just openly ignore the uh, inspections crew and what the uh, P5 plus one has come up with, um, the inspections crew have that way blocked. And if they were to try to sneak around it and do it covertly, then they have that blocked as well. But going on the article, it says, though much ink has been spilled about whether these two paths to the bomb have been blocked, which is debatable, both presuppose a decision by Iran to sacrifice its reconciliation with the world in the next 10 to 15 years for the immediate gratification of building a weapon. The purpose of a covert breakout is less to, is less to avoid detection before crossing the finish line than to make the process less vulnerable to decisive disruption. Now such an abrupt change of heart by the Iranian regime is certainly possible, but more worrisome is the prospect that Iran's nuclear policy after the agreement goes into effect will be much the same as it was before. Comply with the letter and spirit of its obligations only to the degree necessary to ward off unacceptably costly consequences. This will likely take the form of what I call nuclear creepout activities, both open and covert, legal and illicit, designed to negate JCO or POA restrictions without triggering costly multilateral reprisals. It is important to bear in mind that the JCPOA bars signatories from reimposing any sanctions or their equivalents on Iran except by way of a United Nations Security Council resolution restoring sanctions. So basically, once this gene has gotten out of the bottle, which it basically has, the only one that can put it back in the bottle, and they're not going to, is the UN Security Council. Even the United States doesn't have that power. Certainly the U.S. could raise a coalition 
against the UN's uh, wishes and uh, bomb or threaten to bomb Iran, but that's simply not going to happen. We're going on with the article. It says that means there will be no punishment for anything less than a capital crime, explains Robert Satlaw. The language demanded by Iranian negotiators and accepted by the Obama administration makes small-scale cheating virtually unpunishable. So if they cheat a little here or cheat a little there, just go a little over this amount or a little over that amount, by the letter of the law, Iran cannot be punished. And over 10 or 15 years, they could likely raise enough weapons-grade uranium and other items in order to build a bomb within the uh, given parameters of the agreement. And here's something that you really should pay attention to. It says, Moreover, the specific terms of the JCPOA appear to have uh, been designed to give the Iranians wide latitude to interpret their own obligations. Two, in particular, should raise eyebrows. About a thousand kilograms of low-yield uranium is supposedly uh, needed to produce through further enrichment enough weapons-grade uranium for a nuclear explosive device. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that the Obama administration's erroneous path, uh, math is correct. This, this is what the inspectors call a significant quantity. The JCPOA's uh, requ uh, requirement that Iran keep its uranium stockpile under 300 kilograms would force it to enrich a substantial quantity of natural uranium all the way up to weapons grade, thereby lengthening the process of producing a SQ by uh, several months. And again, SQ stands for significant quantity. But what exactly happens to uh, low-yield uranium produced by Iranian centrifuges in excess of the 300 kilogram limit? The JCPOA uh, appendix says it will be down blended to natural uranium level or be sold on the international market and delivered to international buyers. Maintenance of the 300 kilogram unit relies upon Iran continually and punctually reproducing or transferring uh, material it already has, or it already possesses. What happens if Iran's handling of all this is less than perfect? Suppose 100 kilograms or so of low yield uranium in the process of being uh, down blended or delivered to an international buyer of Iran's choosing routinely rem remains recoverable at any one time because of apparent inefficiencies and bottlenecks. Would the international community be willing to cancel the JCPOA over this infraction? Most, almost certainly not. What if this number sw uh, swelled periodically to 50, 150 to two or 200 kilograms every so often because of some special complication or, or uh, another, like a breakout of plant machinery or uh, truck driver strike? So what this article is saying is that Iran has a hundred and one ways in order to tweak the system breaking the rules on occasion, going over limits that they shouldn't go over on occasion, and over time achieve the results they want to without incurring any type of punishment. The Obama administration's uh, one-year breakout time calculation assumes that Iran uses only the uh, 5,060 IR-1 centrifuges it is allowed to have spinning under the JCPOA and that uh, it does not bring more into operation for a whole year after kicking out inspectors and beginning to uh, beginning a sprint for a nuke. This could have been achieved uh, by dismantling the large majority of its roughly 15,000 excess uh, centrifuges falling outside this quota, but Iran insists from the beginning that it would never destroy any of them and its uh, adver adversaries eventually caved. Although U.S. negotiators reportedly proposed a variety of disablement uh, mechanisms designed to slow down the process of reconnecting them, all were rejected by the Iranians and the final agreement makes no mention of any. So even though it says that 5,000 centrifuges will only be used, there's really no agreement to keep that uh, number from growing as high as 15,000. The JCPOA requires only that access uh, uh, centrifuges and associated equipment at Natanz be disconnected 
and put into IAEA monitored storage on site. So the centrifuges are still there, they're just disconnected and in a, in a uh, storage facility on site. There is in a considerable disagreement among informed analysts about how long it would take the Iranians to uh, get an appreciable number of these excess machines up and running with estimates ranging from a few to several months. Whatever the length of time is, the, Iran the Iranians can uh, surely shorten it by training personnel to rapidly reenact centrif centrifuge uh, cascades, modernizing equipment and acquiring new te technology and other methods not explicitly barred by the JCPOA. Indeed, the uh, JCPOA appears to have been drafted by diplomats who failed to imagine that the Iranians might seek to bolster their latent nuclear weapons capacity under the new rules of the game with uh, as much guile and gusto as they did under the old. Considering that the Obama administration's one-year projected breakout time for Iran is deeply flawed to begin with, Ira Iranian exploitation of these loopholes could bring it perilously close to the finish line even while remain officially in compliance with the JCPOA. If the international community has less time to respond to a breakout attempt, an attempt presumably becomes more likely. But as stated earlier in the beginning uh, subheading, it says that, but the real danger is that the mullahs will put off a breakout attempt in the next decade or so while creeping out of their vaguely worried obligations. With so many opportunities to escape the restrictions of the JCPOA, the mullahs, or Iranians, would be fools not to offer the minimal degree of compliance necessary to keep it in force while continually stretching the boundaries of how minimal that degree can be. Openly exploiting the JCPOA's loopholes will, while enjoying its rewards will be more to intimidate Iran's regional rivals than a reckless dash for the end zone or the high-risk culvert attempt while paving their way to an eventual uh, Islamic uh, Republic construction of a nuclear bomb. So frankly, it uh, pays for Iran to do nothing less or nothing more than follow what the uh, negotiations have delivered. They have enough leeway and enough room to maneuver that they can break the rules here and there, find some loopholes to where by the time this 15 years is over, they've broken no set rules, but can move slowly but surely to the eventual creation of a bomb within the 10 to 15 years that they have under this negotiated settlement with the P5 plus one. So why in the world would Iran rush to uh, break any type of agreement that where they can, they can basically get their cake and eat it too? So with this said, don't look for Iran to forego what the negotiations have bared because in time they're going to be able to get what they wanted in the first place. And certainly Israel and the modern Arab nations all know this to be the, the truth. So that's why I see that uh, in the future that the U.S. and the P5 have got to have a second phase of this agreement that must be pulled together. Now, I don't necessarily believe that the United States will come up with a final agreement. I think, like I said, I believe the P5 is going to be fully involved in trying to bring about this uh, umbrella agreement that will bring security to that area. And I think eventually, once the rapture takes place, that a man will come forth out of the uh, European Union who will bring about this umbrella agreement that will make Israel and the Arab world feel safe. And I believe it has to get to the point to where what the Bible says in uh, Daniel, uh, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 38 and verse 11 where it states this, And thou shalt say, I will go, this is talking about the king of the north, and, uh, and Iran is slated to be coming along with him. It says in verse 11, it says, and, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest and dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. In other words, Israel's going to have to be to a point to where they feel safe within their own land. And I don't believe that's going to take place until after the Antichrist rises and brings peace to the region. And certainly that's not where we're at right now. Israel is very worried about their security and is fighting hard not only uh, in Israel but also to uh, defeat this in the U.S. Congress and in other areas in the world. So they're feeling very, very threatened at this time. 
But at some point in time, they're going to put their trust in a man who's going to come forth and is going to convince them that he will confirm this covenant and will make it strong. In other words, he's going to make sure that Iran toes the line and that there will be no attacks on Israel or the uh, uh, Islamic modern nations and that everyone can feel safe with him in charge. So in summary, I do not see Iran breaking out and cheating on there, at least to the degree to where it can be punishable, but cheating on their nuclear agreements, as they have in the past, blatantly. But I see them cutting corners where they're allowed, and over the long term achieving the goal that they had in mind to begin with. And with that taking place, I think the world is going to see that Iran seems to be staying within the, the boundaries of the agreement and there's no sense not to accept it. That's probably what Congress is going to do. I've had some people email me and say, well, I think Congress is going to shoot it down. Well, I don't necessarily believe that, but I, you know, that could very well happen. I think, of course, Mr. Obama has declared that he would veto it if it came down to that, but I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. I look for Iran to toe the line and to stay within the parameters, which are wider than many of us believe. And I think the inspectors are going to come back and give them a good report. But certainly we should not be fooled. Iran, their uh, goal is to achieve a nuclear bomb, and that's still the direction that they're going to take. But as we know, the Bible states that in the end, God will protect Israel, and Iran is doomed from the beginning. But I think the rapture of the church is going to take place before that comes about. And if you don't know the Lord, today is the day of salvation. You know, 150,000 people die every single day. The Bible says the vast majority will end up in a burning hell. Don't let that happen to you. Come to the Lord as Savior today. And you who are Christians, you know we are living in the last days. You need to get a copy of my Tribulation Period Survival Guide and get it to your lost friends and loved ones. Put a copy on your coffee table. When you're gone, they'll have some type of direction that they can go, some type of guide that they can use in order to... To number one, come to the Lord Jesus as Savior. And two, it will give them a direction of what's going to happen over the next seven years or so. I have two versions. I have the free version, which is you can print it out. It takes about 50 pages. Or you can go out and buy the uh, book version of it, paperback book version, which is somewhere around $8. You can go to the About section below, and you can find out where you can get a copy of that. But I'd encourage you to do that today because time is short. Well, this is Terry Malone with the Calvary Prophecy Report.